So welcome to this quick video where I'm going to show you how to write your first unit test using Go. Now if you Google Golang unit testing or Go testing, you probably find this article I put together not too long ago. And one of the things that I, I wanted to show here was how to test uh, just a sum summation function. Okay, maybe we could start with that and we'll see how we go. So as usual, I do like to keep my source code in a Go path. I know Go modules means that not everybody has to do this now, but I still like the organization of it. So we'll call this one, um, we'll call this Alex tests. And the tool that I like to use is Visual Studio Code. Of course, you can use whatever you like. And I hope you're going to find the font big enough here because I don't think I can make it much bigger. And what we're going to do is create a main.go. And this is the, the entry point for our code. Define our package main. And again, we don't really need a lot of code here to, to be able to build this. If you saw the previous video, you would have seen the same thing. This is a no op. And now what I want to do is create a, um, let's create a function. We're gonna call this sum. And unlike in the previous example, I'm not gonna give it a capital letter because it doesn't need to be available outside of the package. And then we want um, x, int, and y. Now if you're um, writing a lot of Golang code, you'll learn some tricks. And one of the tricks is that if you have the same variable repeating more than once, you can actually remove the declaration there. And I've noticed some very experienced Golang programmers not doing that. I don't know if it's because they don't know, or maybe they just don't like the style. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do is return x, um, because I do, when we write this test, I actually want it to fail. Now we can write a test um, alongside this. I think it's better if we do it in a new file. And what we'll have is uh, func test main and this is a, a convention sum uh, let's go so I was going to put even numbers one plus one we'll call it now that's not enough I know the icons have come up but if we run this it will probably warn us the signature needs to be t testing dot t and this is a pointer now we can run that test if you look at my example in the blog, you'll see um, we had something that was much the same and we've got total. So we're actually invoking the, the function that we're testing and that works because everything is in this package. Okay, so sum, we said it was one plus one. What I wanna put is I wanna put got as the output and want as two. Now these named variables could be in but actually naming them makes the test a little bit easier to read and it allows us to write something like this. If got isn't want t dot, and we have a whole bunch of different things we can do from logging to a fatal error to uh, just a regular error or failing the test. I just wanna error, and I'm gonna use error f so that I can introduce these variables. Want D for an integer, got. If you're a C sharp developer, maybe you're doing BDD with, um, I don't know, Ruby or Node.js, you might be feeling uh, pretty annoyed at this style and you might think it's really repetitive. This is more idiomatic Go than using assert. Assert is available in Go, but not in a standard library. So you're perhaps more used to doing something like assert dot is equal one, uh, sum one, one, something like that. There's a project called Testify that can allow you to have that experience in Go. But if you read the blog post, you'll find out why I don't like that and why it perhaps isn't idiomatic. Okay, so do we have enough right now? We want to. We're executing the, um, the action, and then we're, assert, we're sort of asserting or checking the value. So want, got, okay, and then we're gonna get an error. So we can run that. And we've got an error because we wanted to, and we got one because our, our code is effectively 
broken at the moment, it's got a bug in it. Now the other thing you can do is you can copy this command that's generated by the plugin in Visual Studio Code and you will need to quote it to run it and you can get the value this way. Now if there are any log messages, we don't normally see them unless we put dash V and then if we had some sort of logging in the sum function, we should get that printed out as well. So put a print line in here and print this info. And then we see the value. Now it's up to you whether you want the dash V or not. I find it helpful in CI. So let's now fix this test so we know that the value needs to be 2, return 2. We've passed the test. We can now sum and we're done. Or are we? We need to write another test. Let's do it something like um, an odd number and an even. Right, 1 plus 2. So we've got 1 and 2. We want to get 3. Let's run that again. Now this time we can run it individually or we can run the whole lot. We run the whole lot. We want three, but we got two. Now, here it's going to be a bit tricky to hack this. We could look at the values or we could just do what we needed to do in the beginning. Okay, and we can go and run those again from the terminal. This time, not specifying the specific fixture. And we get the value out. It says okay. So, so far, I hope we're, we're all good um, with what we've done here. And then we can actually use this in our code if we wanted to in the main. Um, we could start to look at maybe something like the, the flags, um, so the arguments, parsing them. Maybe we could look at flags and having some sort of integer variable like x and y and adding them up. And that's how we could use this package. But at the moment, we've produced a, a function that is effectively private and is unit tested. Now you could probably imagine that this style could get repetitive, right? And if you have used things like um, NUnit or even the equivalent in the Java world, you will, you will notice there's some annotations that you can put on those variables, right? So you would be able to specify a range, etc., etc. We can do something pretty similar in Go. I'm going to reference the blog post now and a little bit more advanced. What we can do is we can use something called a test table. And here, what we've got is we were summing up and we're saying, right, um, this is the X and Y, and this is what I expect. So one and one is two, two and two is four, etc. And that can be a little less repetitive, although it is harder to write up front, a bit more energy. I think it's generally worth it. So let's try that out. So we want to test um, range of values, let's call it. And again, we just want a regular signature, and here we need to define our test cases. This, the syntax is kind of odd, so we're going to use an inline struct here, and then define what that struct is, and then what values go in it. Now you could actually go and use a, a struct that you've defined separately, but there's probably not a lot of point in having a type in your code just for this. So there's the syntax we want. We want struct as, an, as, a, as a slice the values and then we want to specify them and, and put them within effectively something like a, a tuple. Right. There's our outer struct. Now um, let's go for similar naming. We have x and we'll call it let's call it want because it's a bit more in line with what we've looked at. And then within here we covered one and one equals two and we covered one and two three we could do two and two is four. Okay. Now one of the things that I actually do like and I've not mentioned here is the ability to then name that test case with a string. Okay, and let's put that at the end. Now we or the beginning, let's say, and now we can go right, um, that is called one and one. This is called odd and even. And that's called even and even, which kind of reflects what we were doing here. It was a little bit more hacky in the name. Next thing we want to do is iterate around this. So for um, 
call it TC for test case within the range of test cases. Now we can access TC and we've got the name here. And this is something I didn't put in the blog post. It still went around the table, but I didn't do what I want to do. What I want to do is name that test case with a subtest so that if we get an error or logs, it doesn't just say um, the sum was incorrect, it will tell us the name that we had as well. So I believe the syntax is t for the outer t dot run and the name of the test case and then we put another function within it and we put t testing dot, dot t again and close that off. Now we can get the got just like we did before equals sum tcx tcy and that is our got we can probably use most of the same message before okay uh, and we might even just want to put in four x plus y uh, we wanted that but we got that okay and now we can put in tc x tcy we've got a bit more of a complete error message and we could carry on or we could fail there so it's up to you if you want to fail as soon as you get one message because you know a bug is a bug or you want to run all the tests that's fine too if you've got one error f that should fail the, the test at the end now if everything was done correct here we will see this working let's try it Okay, once that should be TC want one more place I've missed it TC want okay that looks good now what I'm going to do is deliberately fail this if x equals 2 and y equals 2 return 5 right. just so that I can show you what would happen and you see here, we've got a forward slash and then the name of that test case we specified has been brought out. Again, our error says for two plus two, we wanted four, we got five. And now if I was running this in CI, I'd get the opportunity to go ahead and, and grab that data from my logs and fix that problem. However, we don't want the bug in the code. We're gonna run it again let's just check all of our tests are happy so you might see this um, coverage here this is something that I find interesting too and what it's showing is that 100% of those code paths are covered in the sum function what if we added a, a path right if x is over 100 um, return x plus 100 again just introducing an arbitrary bug we're going to run this code and what you should see I mean, obviously you don't want a bug in your code. We should see coverage is now less than 100%. Okay. And it shows us where it's missing. Back to the blog post, and you'll see again um, various options here about testing, about how you can get the coverage from the command line. You can even generate a HTML report. It might be nice for CI. Um, and then you've got the ability to go off and start thinking about how could I isolate dependencies? For instance, if we had something that was going to go over the internet or HTTP server, how could we test that? And that is for another video. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something. If you have, like and subscribe. Let me know what you want to see next and follow me on Twitter. Thanks.